from day Still that hope that lies within it is reassured As I keep my eyes upon the distant shore I know you'll lead me safely to that blessed place he has prepared But if the storms don't cease And if the winds keep on blowing my Sometimes it's hard to tell the night from day Still that hope that lies within it is reassured As I keep my eyes upon the distant shore I know you'll be me safely to that blessed place he has prepared. But if the storms don't cease, and if the wind keeps on blowing, And unmovable despite the time. But if, if the storms don't cease, and just in case the winds they keep on blowing in my life, my. My soul's been anchored in, in the Lord. <clears throat> my soul, my soul's been anchored in, in the Lord. me that uh, I should not sway because he holds me fast so dark the day clouds in the sky I know it's alright cause Jesus is my hand and my soul my soul my in the 
from Psalms, Psalms 31, verse 5, be reading from the New King James Version. And it reads, I will, into your hands I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. I'd like to tag this text with your prayers, but above all, with God's presence, you're in good hands walking down the street, driving in a car, sitting on the sofa in your house, lying in the bed in your house, sleeping in a car in public. Those are just few of the ways that black people in the United States have been killed by those who are supposed to protect and serve. Those are just a few ways that how police officers killed black people. And we know that this has been going on for a long time, not, not just from George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or Eric Gardner or Ahmaud Arbery, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, Walter Scott. This has been going on for a while, even before we had cameras. We, before we had a uh, videotape readily available to us, we would hear black and brown people crying out because police brutality. Uh, a matter of, matter of fact, going back even further than that, 400 years in the United States of America, longer than 400 years having to deal with systemic racism every day for 400 years. And these are the life experiences of black and brown people in America. As a consequence, when there are the possibility of a lot of anger, a possibility of a lot of frustration, depression, hopelessness, helplessness, tears, crying, fatigue because of a life experience of oppression every day. And I wanted to bring that up because I want you to get an understanding of the context in which Psalm 31 was written. Now, David is the writer of Psalms 31, and we know that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and God inspired David to write Psalms 31. And when you read Psalm 31, you hear about the life experiences of David. He, he talks about the plot against him and the attacks against him. He, he talks about social injustice. He talks about the hurts, pain, and distress of being in a jam uh, between a rock and a hard place. He talks about the troubles, tribulation, the heartaches, hard times, difficulty that he has gone through. And as a consequence of that, in Psalms 31, he brings up the depression. He brings up the inner anxiety. He, he brings up the concerns. He brings up anger, uh, misunderstanding with all those trials and troubles, with all those problems, pain, with all those hurt, harassments, because a lot of us are going through that right now. And David says in Psalms 31, he opens it up as a prayer. Look at Psalms 31, verse 2 and verse 3. Bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be my rock, my of refuge, a, a fortress of defense to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Psalm 31 is a prayer from the very beginning. He begins to pray out to God because he's teaching you and I that in the midst of difficulties and hardship, we got to learn how to take it to the Lord in prayer. David said, God, I, I need you to incline your ear unto me. God, I, I need you to listen to me. I need you to answer me. I need you to show up for me, protect me. And he prays to God. God, I need you to be my rock. I need you to be my fortress. 
You are the source of strength, my safety, dear God. I, I need you to be my refuge, a, a hiding place before me, my fortress. He's praying, and we have to learn to take it to the Lord in prayer. And, and there may be some people that believe that, you know, prayer, prayer is okay. And, but we need something practical to handle this situation of systemic racism and police brutality and the gunning down of unarmed black and brown people. In, in many cases, they are innocent and no consequences to it. I, I just want to say in the midst of all that is going on, prayer is practical. Prayer does work. We need God in this. And, and this is what the Bible says. In the book of James, the fifth chapter, verse 16, I want to read the B clause. It says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. E effectual prayer. Prayer is effective. It, it availeth much. Yes, prayer gets much done. Prayer is practical. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask and it shall be done unto you. It's practical. It gets things done. It works. And we need to learn how to pray. We need to have to incline our prayer in all the protests. We need to include prayer in the marches, in all the civil disobedience. We need to make sure that prayer is a part of this. Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Ask, yes. Prayer is about receiving. Seek not. You have to participate in the prayer. Now, if you're not willing to be a part of the answer to the prayer, you're really not praying at all. You're asking because prayer is about receiving, but seeking, knocking, that's participation. And when I'm really praying for laws to change and policies to change and social injustice, equality to change, and if I'm not willing to be a part of the answer, I'm not seeking and knocking. I'm just asking and is really not praying because prayer is practical. Prayer gets a lot of things done. Let's look at verse two. Bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be my rock of refuge, a fortress of this defense to save me. David is saying, I need you to be my rock. I, I need you to be my fortress. He's praying and asking for that. And then let's look at verse three. For you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. David is asking God, you be my fortress. You be my rock. You be the one that holds me. You secure me and protects me. And then in the next breath, he says, you are my rock. You are my fortress. You are my strength. That's because prayer, what it did, it revealed who God was. Prayer was a reminder. The very thing you're asking for God, you already have. The very thing you want God to be to you, he already is that to you. And prayer reminding him of what he already had. When you believe Jesus died on the cross and God raised him from the dead and the Holy Spirit moves inside of you and your sins are forgiven. God is your father and Jesus is your big brother. He becomes your rock. He, he is the rejected stone that became the chief cornerstone. He's the rock of our salvation. And what Jesus, what David, excuse me, was praying for, that prayer reminded him he already had it. And what he wanted God to be to him, prayer revealed to him God is already that to him. We have to make sure we include prayer. Look at verse four. Pull me out of this trap. You and I have to trust that God will pull us out of this trap. Verse four, pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me, for you are my strength. Now, when you read Psalm 31, David keeps talking about trust and confidence in the Lord. 
He has enough trust in the Lord to believe that God will pull him out of what he called a trap or, or a net. That they, the trap or the net that they would use to catch birds in that day. And, and since it's a net, it's a trap, it didn't get there accidentally. It got there intentionally. This is the intent. The trap didn't happen by chance. It was by choice. It was the intent of somebody to trap him. That's why we're trying to get across to the people in the United States, those of us who are black and brown, that what we have seen, these systems, whether it be policy of police or economic systems that ignore the community of black and brown and poor people, or rather it is the educational system where resources are taken from poor communities and take them to the wealthiest, wealthiest communities in the state. These are systems, and it is not by accident. It is by intent. It's a trap. It's a net that people are making these policies and decisions in order to distress us and put us in a tight, put us in a jam. Uh, it could be between a rock and a hard place to have us hitting rock bottom. But here was David said, I trust God. I trust God that you will pull us out of this trap. And I want to have enough trust that you would trust God. Yes, you may be in a trap, but you just keep trusting God. Yes, you may be in trouble, but keep trusting God. Yes, you are in tribulation, but Keep trusting God because God has the power to pull us out. That's what hope is. Expectation. That's what hope is. Hope is expectation that things will get better. I believe that God can do it because God has a history of pulling people out of traps. Yes, you can always tell what somebody is going to do based on what they've already done. And when I look at what God has already done, God is in the business. He's got a history of pulling people out of traps. Mm -hmm, yes, he pulled the three Hebrew boys out of a trap, that trap of a fiery furnace. The Lord did that. The, the Lord pulled Daniel out of a trap. He was in that lion's den. The, the Lord pulled Peter out of a trap. He was trapped between four guards in prison, but God sent an angel and brought him out of that trap. God pulled Paul and Silas out of a trap. Prayer is practical. They prayed and sang at midnight, and God sent an earthquake and pulled them out of that trap. I can testify in my own life on more than one occasion when I found myself stressed in a jam, a rock in a hard place. But God, but God, the God I serve showed up because of my trust in him and pulled me out of the trap. And some may be saying it's, it's taken so long. It's been more than 400 years of oppression for black people in America. And you're telling us to trust God that he'll pull us out of a trap. Well, those of us who are Christians and we accept the Bible as the authority of God and the truth of God. And when you read your Bible and you have some understanding of the context in which God moves, you will discover that the Hebrew people had been in slavery and in, in oppression in Egypt more than 400 years. And after more than 400 years, God sent a prophet named Moses. And he said, tell the people, I have seen their affliction. I have heard their cry and I came down to answer them. I, I came down to rescue them. I came down to deliver them. But it was more than 400 years and we celebrate that deliverance. We just got to wait on God. And I know sometimes God don't move like we want him to move. But I know God will move and I'm trusting him. I have the confidence to know he will pull us out of this trap, even at the 400 years. Let's look. Look at verse five. It says, into your hand I commit my spirit. Yes. 
you have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. Into your hand I, I commit my spirit. Into your hands, O Lord, I commit my life. Into your hands I commit my soul. Yes, there's problems. Yes, there's pain. Yes, there's difficulty. Yes, there's plots against me. And all of this in Psalms 31. But David said, even in the midst of all of this, breaking loose into your hands, I commit my spirit, my soul, my life is in your hands. And that's where you need to make sure that you're putting your soul in the hand of God. Let's go to verse number nine. And it says what? Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I'm in trouble. My eyes are wasted away with grief. Yes, my soul and my body. David says, I cried until my tears was wasted. My, I cried until my eyes was wasted. I, I cried and my eyes out. I cried my eyes out. And, and when he cried his eyes out, even to the point, yes, my soul, even to the point of my body. David said all of this stuff I was going through, these life experience has affected my soul and my body, my soul. The soul is made up of mind, emotion, and will. The soul. The, the, the soul is made up of the intellectual, the emotional, and the volitional. Uh, the soul. The soul is what you think, feel, and do. And, and anybody who is not saved, if your soul is not saved, then your soul is lost. Your soul is dead and that your soul doesn't have life. And that means your mind is darkened and that your emotions are distorted and your will is dead. And you couldn't even obey God if you wanted to. Your soul is dead. Mind, emotion and will. David said not only did it affect my soul, it affect my body. Let's look at verse nine again. Have mercy on me, O Lord. For I'm in trouble. My eyes are wasted away with grief. Yes, look, my soul and my body. The mind and the soul is so closely related that they catch up with each other. They're so closely related, they catch up with each other, each other diseases. And if you keep messing with a person's mind, come on, somebody and you keep messing with a person's emotions, eventually it's going to get to their bodies. You can't oppress a community. You can't have these racist policies. You can't have police officers beating down on black and brown people who are innocents and then no consequences to them. And then blame black people with all this oppression that has impacted our minds and it will show up in our bodies as well. That's what David is saying. In the midst of all that, I put all that in the Lord's hand. Yes, it's messed up. Oh, yes, it's jacked up. But it's in the Lord's hand now. I took my soul, my mind, my emotions, my will, and I committed them to the Lord's hand because that soul was dead. But when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, your soul is safe. The soul is mind, emotion, and will. And when your soul is saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, then your mind is motivated. Your mind is enlightened. Your mind is captivated and your emotions are motivated and your will is activated. And now you can start living in a way that God is pleased and you are blessed. But take your life, your soul and your body and everything you have and put it in the Lord's hand. Let's, let's look at verse 15. Let's look at verse 15. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and those who persecute me. I'm not just putting my life in the Lord's hands, but I'm putting my future in the Lord's hand. Time. 
Time is future. But time is not just your future. It's your past, present, and future. And all is in the Lord's hand. There is no day or time that I'm not putting my life in the hand of the Lord. And when you do that and you are praying, your life is in his hand and God will pull you out of whatever you're dealing with and whatever you are facing. We want to close with this. Look at Luke 23, familiar passage of scripture, Luke 23, 46. And it says this. When Jesus cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, until unto your hands, I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. That's when Jesus was on the cross. In the Gospel of Luke, that was one of the last seven words he quoted. Jesus quoted Psalms 31 and 5. And to your hands, I commit my spirit. Before that, I remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was having a peaceful protest. He wants the kingdom of God to come and to establish the rule and righteousness of God. Jesus is praying. Yes, this is a peaceful protest. And here come the military police and interrupt his peaceful protest and arrest him for something they should have never arrested Jesus for. Understand, Jesus didn't get crucified because he claimed to be the son of God. A lot of people claim to be the Messiah. He didn't get cruci crucified for that. Jesus got crucified because he came and he started addressing the religious system the social system and the political system and the economical system of that day. That's wrong. You are just taking care of people at the top. He started addressing those systems. And when he started addressing those systems, the next thing you know, he was being arrested. And now he's being beaten by the military police. They beat him and whipped him all night long an unarmed, innocent man being beaten down by military police. Even when he stood before the judge Pilate and Pilate said, I find no fault in him, he's innocent. Then why, if he's innocent, you are treating him like he's guilty? And all that took place on that cross. Jesus said, unto your hands, I commit my spirit. But Jesus added father to it. Jesus added his father into your hands. I, I know what brothers and sisters are doing, but I still claim you as father. We understand Jesus, he is the only begotten of the father. And we know who Jesus is. Yes, he is the son of God. He calls him father. And Jesus is saying, I'm still in relationship with you regardless of what brothers and sisters have done to me. Brothers and sisters, don't allow what other brothers and sisters do to you to get in the way of your relationship with your heavenly father. When Jesus died on the cross and God raised him from the dead and whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, God becomes our father. And when you pray, pray this prayer, pray our father. And that relationship with God will get you through all of what you're going up against. In life right now, in these hard, difficult times, we have to put it all in the hand of the Lord. And when Jesus did that, he was able to bounce back in the resurrection. And when you put it in the Lord's hand, that doesn't mean we won't get attacked. But what it does mean, when it's all said and done, we will bounce back. I love the hymn that says, life is filled with swift transition. None on earth can move or stand. You got to build your hope on things eternal and hold on 
to God's unchanging hand. Hold, hold on to his hand. God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. May the Lord continue to bless and keep you is my prayer. Amen. For those who have asked how to pay their tithes or give an offering, we have three ways. The first is the church website at plcbaptist.org. On the home page, you would scroll down and look for Give Online. It's safe and secure. Just follow the steps. The second is you can mail in a check or money order. No cash, please. The church address is 11473 West Larch Road, 95304, or by text to 209-822-2009. Also, we still have church office hours during the week. You can give us a call and just let us know that you'll be dropping off your tithes. The phone number is 209-833-7258. I'm praying for this world, and I know without a doubt that this too shall pass, and God is still in control. God bless you.